going live? What? Starting the timer. I think. I don't know. Something's wrong with my uh, Chrome. Uh oh. I don't know what the hell's going on. All right. I think we're ready to roll. <laughs> okay, oh, I guess. Chrome. My my online stopwatch that I used to time this says not a number. <laughs> like, all I do is click the start button, and it's supposed to work. Something's wrong with my Chrome. All right. Well, we'll all right. Time's maybe off for this episode, guys. Apologies in advance. <laughs> yeah. In five, four, three, two. Hello and welcome back to another exciting episode of DSLR Film New Podcast. Mitch from Planet 5D joins me today to discuss the new Ursa Mini, a bunch of other stuff, actually some action cams and some price drops in cameras. But first, Mitch, before we get started, what have you been up to, man? Hey, DJ. Thanks for having me on yet again to this exciting episode of I used the... exciting, didn't I? Sorry. Yeah, you did. No, you, yeah, it's all right. You've been doing it for a couple of weeks, but I've let you go. It's hard. I know it's hard to come up with all these demonstrative words because, like, when you're writing a blog post and you're going, well, you want people to read it and you don't want it to be clickbait, but you really, really think it's important. So you can't use the uh, phrase... Game changer? game changer <laughs> so you can't do that and you, so you got to say astounding you know you got to come up with words it's hard coming up with words this is the most incredible dslr film new podcast ever i actually use a uh, a word editing software that works in chrome and it's called let me see here what it's called it's called grammarly and i don't yeah. know if you're familiar with grammarly but uh you add that extension to your chrome browser and when you're writing articles, it uh, helps you not only with spell check, but also with commas. And my favorite, uh, it gives you overused words and synonyms to those words. So <laughs> when you want to drop that game changer into your article, you can game check Grammarly changer. and it'll give you other words to use, such as exciting, extraordinary, <laughs> interesting, and so on, that are all synonyms for the word that you are searching for. Very handy. Uh, it's uh, I think I pay for it. It's a uh, hundred dollars for a two-year subscription. Well worth it if you write quite a bit of stuff, and it uh, basically works in every version. But this is not a writing show. This is well, it's a screenwriting show. We've just turned it into a screenwriting show. <laughs> hey, speaking of screenwriting, uh, there is, and I'll, I'll if I remember, I'll put this in the show notes. But there's a fifteen hundred dollar prize out for screenwriters who write horror films. So. If you've written any kind of horror uh, script in the last uh, six to five months or so, and you'd like to submit it to that, I'll try and get that in the show notes. Check it out. Uh, $1,500 grand prize for your script and the possibility of it going into full production. On my end, guys, I've been testing out equipment, uh, running around, doing some more product videos for a local company here. And that's about it. Nothing extremely exciting. Still a little bit sick, so I'll try not to cough yeah. <laughs> into the... The mic. But hey, with speaking that, of, oh, speaking of, um, I posted uh, yesterday that uh, there's a new giveaway, not a giveaway. Uh, well, we do have a new giveaway on Planet 5D that you ought to check out. Go to planet5d.com slash giveaway. Uh, but uh, Musicbed is doing something for filmmakers as well, and they have $50,000 in prizes. Oh, wow. Is that right? That sounds I, right. I think I have the right number. Yeah. Uh, so make sure you go to plan5d.com and check that article out as well. You know, I wish I'd, uh, we should probably just start an ongoing list of giveaways. There's also something uh, going on from, uh, I want to say M Audio, and uh, they're giving away uh, $2,000 worth of keyboards and music gear uh, for huh. songs. But uh, uh, let's. Uh, there's a lot of that stuff oh, going okay. on right now. We'll try and narrow that down and put it into something. That seems like a good thing for... Uh, I don't know, maybe some sort of page on planet5d.com where you could find all of these interesting uh, giveaways. Hey, Mitch, you got anything on yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, uh, I tried that at one time. It's hard to keep up with. I mean, there's 
at times there are tons of them and times there's virtually none. So maybe that's a good idea. Maybe I'll try that again. Anyway, let's move on with the show. All right. I think it's time for the... Time for the news. Time for the news. Mitch actually added this one to the show notes, and I kind of wanted to talk about it because it looks really fun, exciting, and it's also disappointing because I just bought a new camera and replaced my 5D Mark III. (laughs) Uh, According to canonrumors.com, there may be a 5D Mark IV that is extremely video-oriented. It's going to have all the bells and whistles and kind of be based extremely towards filmmakers. Now, Mitch, you've looked into this as well. What do you think about this? Is this something that we can actually believe will happen, or is Canon just blowing some more smoke up our posteriors? (laughs) DJ, well, I I did spring this on you like five minutes before we started the show. Um, I found it and I thought, well, we ought to I'll talk. We ought to talk about it because we've we've bashed Canon, and everybody has bashed Canon. And again, we don't know if this is true. Of course, we don't know if it's true. It's just rumor. But Craig over at Canon Rumors does a very good job of di- digesting all of the different specs and different rumors out there. And if what he says is true the the last blurb was apparently the plans for the video features changed about a year ago and became an important part of the development now we've we've all talked about how the market has changed and 4k has become a lot more prevalent 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 in the last it's i don't know we start these early shows and sometimes my brain's just like foggy Uh, but I think we've all said that if Canon doesn't do something, they're going to lose huge market share. And maybe they finally woke up and said, hey, this is the perfect camera that was that needs to have advanced features on it. Let's let's go back and put them in because we we all know that the 5D and the and the 1DX are on like a three to four year product cycle. Absolutely. And it takes them a long time to get features into these cameras, get them tested, get them fully baked into the cameras. So that sounds good. It sounds about right for those those things that we know about how slowly the Canon ship moves. So this could be great news. I would love to see a lower megapixel count to separate the 5D Mark IV from the 1DX line. So maybe, you know, like 14 or 18 megapixels, 4K shooting, you know, uh, maybe an XLR audio adapter of some kind, maybe similar to what Sony does with their smart hot shoe or maybe something like Panasonic's grip that has XLR inputs. I would love to see headphone jacks. That would, you know, that would be nice. Uh, maybe some Magic Lantern fe- features like focus peaking and zebras. That would be really good. And what would I pay for something like that? I would gladly spend $3,200 the standard price of a brand new 5D Mark III when it was first released and kind of a going price for Canon cameras in general when they first hit the market in that price range. I don't know, though. I'm skeptical as to when we'll see this camera. Uh, You mentioned before the show, Mitch, that you thought this wouldn't come out until after the 1DX Mark II. Uh, When is that due for release? Do you know? Well, again, according to Canon Rumors, um, the end of April is when that's supposed to be sharp shipping, <laughs> shipping, shipping out, and <laughs> shipping April. in quantities. Uh, and for whatever reason, according to Craig, the Canon has decided not to announce it until after those are shipping. Okay, so what's the reason? They want to sell a boatload of the one DXs before they sell. You know, there. So there's going to be. A small segment of the market that buys a 1DX for the video features, right? And then goes, oh, crap, really? <laughs> you put better video features in the 5D Mark IV? Oh, gosh, now i got to sell my 1DX Mark II. No. So I don't know. Well, it is uh, a 5000 well, we might as well say $6,000 camera. So uh, and it's, it, it is interesting to hear the video features possibly coming to the 5D Mark IV when you look at what Nikon is doing right now. You know, they didn't just release the D5. They also released the D500, which is kind of a pared down. And and sure, it is a cropped version of 4K, but I mean, that camera does have a lot of features. Uh And there isn't really, usually Nikon and and Canon work in sort of, 
mirrored image. N neither one of them are identical to each other, but one does something like a high megapixel camera, and then the other one immediately releases, you know, the 5DS or something like that. Or, you know, Nikon adds a feature and Canon adds another competitive feature that's not quite the same but similar. Uh, but in this round, it sort of seems like Nikon uh, got to the punch first and released both a high-end and a lower-priced model with 4K internal recording, and Canon has only got the 1DX Mark II and 1DX. Well, let's not forget that uh, Nikon was the very first DSLR that had video features. That was the D90, wasn't it? Yes. So Nikon does appear to almost always be ahead of Canon releases. Canon just, waits and refines it just a little bit because, come on, nah, the D ninety was pretty pretty rough. No, I don't. I don't think that's possible for Canon to, unless they had some sort of early information. I don't. I don't see that because again, the ship, the Canon ship, moves so slowly uh, because they have to have everything virtually perfect, which is good for us. Um, so. And and by the way, speaking of that, which we didn't, I did, I I meant to maybe put that in the show notes. Did you see the complaints about Sony support that oh, I published yeah. the story the other day? Yeah, um, Sony is and, not good about uh, having customer service in general, and even I believe don't they have a similar to CPS where you can pay money in? And they do just now. They just announced that, which hmm. they never had before. That's rough. Um, and and it and I. It's something that we haven't talked about, and it's something that's very important for filmmakers to make sure they're paying attention to. It's and it's often way off in the corner of your mind. Well, you know, my camera is not going to break, right? It's just going to work. And if it does break, and I think most of us have had something that didn't survive some little test that we gave it, uh, that. <laughs> It's critical, and that's one of the things that's kept Canon on top because several people wrote to me and said, yeah, that's why I still buy Canon gears because I know it's going to work, and I know there are professional services if you use that service. is going to get the camera fixed within a week as opposed to the, the example that, that was reported uh, where the guy sent his Sony off and it took two months to get it back. You know, it's... It's well, very important if you're doing a lot of shooting. If you're uh, if you haven't used the CPS service, guys, uh, one of the great things about it is actually free cleanings every year. Uh, you can send your lenses in, uh, get your lenses cleaned up uh, there and and sent back. And if you do send in gear that's broken, uh, if it's going to be there for an extended period of time, Canon will oftentimes send you a loaner uh, yep. to use until you get your camera back, which is extremely nice. Uh, they also, if you're part of the, I think it's, what is it, $100 a year, Mitch? Do you remember? Yes. Uh, so $100. There's two levels. But... Yeah, and you basically, you can add equipment to whichever level you're at. So you're allowed so many lenses, so many pro bodies. And they also give you, a, I want to say, like a 30 or 40% discount on repairs. Uh, it still can be expensive. Um, speaking of my own problems with an HDMI port that required an entire board, uh, replacement, which was the cost of a used 5D Mark III, which I ended up uh, just buying a used 5D Mark III. But uh, it is nice, and they, they are very prompt. And uh, uh -huh. if you go to any of the conferences, too, that's the other thing. Uh, they'll set up CPS booths and just clean anything there for free when you bring it in, as yep. long as you're part of the CPS program. And uh, that is excellent, excellent customer service. I've never – does Nikon have a, a version of this? I think they do, yes. Is, uh, do you know if it's any good? I mean, I know you're not a Nikon guy, but uh, you usually have the skinny on these sorts of things. <laughs> skinny, that's funny. Uh, no, I I don't. I know they do. I'm 99% sure they do, and that's one of the things that, again, I think keeps them on the top of the business, even though we complain about them you know, not having this feature or that feature. There's a lot of people that really love their Nikon gear, and uh, the the differentiator there with CPS and the Sony things uh, is, and, and I found this out when I first signed up for CPS with Canon, which kind of surprised me, is that if you just have a single body and maybe you have two lenses, 
that's not enough gear to qualify. You have yeah. to have a certain level, and and with Canon, you get points, and then the and the new Sony program, you have to have two full frame bodies in order to even qualify. And their their service is one hundred and fifty dollars a year just to get started. Um, so there, you know, there are there are some of us little people that don't have enough bodies or lenses to qualify. Um, but it's it's, it's a never, great service. Yeah, you know. Honestly, if you're a, a pro shooter or even a filmmaker, uh, you generally have, I, w I would guess, at least two bodies uh, because you don't want to lose, you know, have one go down or you want to have two lenses on a body at the same time, right. you know. So uh, I could see how, if, you know, if you're just uh, getting started, that might be a rough uh, bar to jump over the top of. I mean, that's 4000 or $5,000 worth of just camera bodies alone and then lenses in order to get and the, the program. and the key is i'm sorry i'm stepping all over you again but the key there is they have to be full frame bodies so yeah. if you have a sony crop camera or a sony point and shoot or something that doesn't count it gives you no points for that um well, if i know you're going to talk about sony bodies i would have brought my I'm sorry. in with me but uh, <laughs> uh the build quality of the a7s and a7s mark ii is not the same as the build quality of a 5D Mark III or a Nikon right. D800, uh, those cameras are big and bulky for a reason. They're, you know, well made, very water sealed, very solid. If you look at any of the teardowns of the Sony A7S, it's a lot of glue. You know, there's <laughs> as few screws as they can get into that thing, and uh, right. sandwiched together as possible. And if you think about that in terms of abuse in the field, if you're one of those photographers or filmmakers who just throws your kit around like it doesn't mean anything to you, uh, that could be uh, an issue for you, definitely. Could be. Have you ever worked with anybody that uh, does that, where all their lenses are just scratched up and beat to tar, and their their bodies have like duct tape on them, and you know masking <laughs> tape and gaffer's uh, tape all over them? Well, I I do find it very interesting when you <clears throat> when you survive in this business for a while. Uh, you learn a lot of things. And one of the things that Barry Anderson taught me, cha -ching, my good friend Barry, uh, is that if you're if you're buying used gear, he always says, go find a photographer that's selling their gear because filmmakers beat the crap out of their gear and photographers keep it pristine. And it turns out, I think that's pretty true. If you look around, photographers are like, they coddle their gear. They, they covet it. They... They really take care of it, and filmmakers just use the hell out of it. I'm kind of so. in the middle. I like to take care of my stuff, but uh, if it gets cracked or abused because I have to run around with a camera all day, I mean, that's just part of the game. <coughs> and part of the game also costs me <laughs> replacements of lenses, and I don't yep. Man, I'm still sick. This is awful. Uh, it's okay. You know, it's um, okay, DJ. We, we understand that bronchitis takes forever to get rid of. You'll, we'll, we're all right with you. This has we been hanging it. on for for three weeks or maybe four weeks now. Uh, moving on down the line to other things that are a little glitchy, let's talk about RoboCam real quick. Uh, RoboCam, I actually, I kind of picked this up from you, Mitch. Uh, this was something you, you mentioned a, a few months back, and I've got a link to kind of when we started talking about this a while ago. This is a software program that allows you to control multiple Panasonic cameras via Wi-Fi from a single router. Now, what you got to remember here is that this is all wireless, and the wireless antennas in your cameras, for one, aren't the greatest. Uh, also, if you're on a Wi-Fi oh. infrastructure with a lot of stuff, uh, you can run into problems. Now, I was just testing this out, and here's what I've got right here to make this a little bit smoother. This is Wow, a, what a cool camera. Yeah, this oh. right here is basically a battery-powered uh, wireless AC router that is capable of running for two or three days on its own battery power. So you set this out, create your own Wi-Fi network, and once you've got that Wi-Fi network working, you can use that instead of your home infrastructure uh, with RoboCam in order to use multiple cameras. In this case, I was testing out the LX100 and the Panasonic GH4, and it does work, but uh, it's got some glitches here and there. Uh, controls sometimes lock up the cameras. Uh, when I was trying to focus with the LX100, 
I would occasionally get zooms instead of focuses. I'm not sure what's going on there. <laughs> ah. It's it's interesting, but I don't think the the software is fully baked. And at uh, forty dollars a pop, uh, there are some open source options, and I've got links to those in the show notes. Uh, just swing over to DSLRFilmNoob.com to check that out. But Mitch, have you used any kind of uh, uh, tethered or untethered controller for your cameras in the past? The only thing that I have used, and I have to actually dig it out because I think I'm going to try to use it this weekend or next weekend, uh, is is a USB controller that is wired um, to the 5D, and I, I'm i blanking <laughs> even who produced that gum thing. I know it's over there in the corner. At least I think it's over there in the corner. But wireless is is good, but it's flaky. So these things are only forty dollars a piece. Uh, so the the router right here is about forty dollars, and then the software is forty dollars. So you could spend upwards of eighty bucks to get this to work. Uh, you or could not do work. it with your home network, but if you have a lot of congestion in your home network. Uh, then you're probably going to need a separate router. Now, if you don't mind plugging in a router at location, you could go grab a router from your house, a wireless router, and do that. And if you already have one, then it's just the software investment of $40. Uh, they do actually recommend that you wire in your laptop uh, with an Ethernet cable and then dedicate the Wi-Fi only to your cameras if you're going to use more than two cameras uh, with the software. Um, I'm going to keep testing this, but... I, I don't know. I don't see me using this in the field just because you can't deal with little sketchy results like that. Yeah. What would you use it for? Why would you have remote access to your cameras? Imagine for a moment, if you will, doing an Imagine. interview. And you want to set up three different cameras. So one on the interviewer uh, and two angles on the interviewee. Uh, maybe a close-up and a medium or maybe a side angle and a, a, a you know dead on straight in front of them sort of camera shot. Right. right. With that, I could hit record on all three cameras simultaneously, see kind of what's going on on all three cameras, and control anything like changing focus or what have you for all those streams. And I don't have to do any running around like a madman and pushing buttons on all the cameras to get them going. And I don't have cool. to have multiple people. So I'm saving on staffing. Now what? that dream is is always uh, is nice to have, but uh, if you can't get it to work, then it's not viable. Uh, yeah. What, what I do with interviews a lot of times, though, uh, because the control app for Panasonic's GH4 is so good, is I run one camera and I use my phone app for the GH4 to start and stop recording on that camera, and that combination it does at least give you a two camera shoot. And uh, you don't have to have two people in order to uh, accommodate that, which is, it, it is nice. I, I, don't get right. me wrong. I would love to see yeah. the ability to log into multiple cameras with my phone. And even if I can't see what they're doing, maybe get them set up and start recording on them. That would be really handy. Maybe somebody that's a, you know, Kickstarter idea, uh, <laughs> the ability to start recording on multiple brands of cameras simultaneously with one push of the button. That would be awesome. I would pay for that. You know, one thing, uh, and this is way off topic, but you just you just mentioned a multiple camera shoot. Uh, I would love to see, and I told Canon this not too long ago, uh, that let's suppose you have multiple cameras, and or or you even have some volunteers that are coming going to come in and shoot. Wouldn't it be nice if you, as the director, producer, or whatever, uh, could set up your camera? And get all the settings exactly the way you want it, and and take a like an SD card or CF card and hand it to the other people and have them just import all of those settings, so that their cameras would all be set up exactly with the same Kelvin and the same shutter speed and and all those different things that you have to manually go through and go. Did I set everything the same way? Wouldn't that be nice if they did that? I I believe you could do that at least to a certain extent with the uh, magic lantern installed uh, the magic lantern xml file that st stores all of your settings for the camera uh, you can take that out and put it in another camera or copy it over to multiple sd cards and share the information across 
multiple Canon cameras, but mm. it would that be great. Use Magic Lantern. Yeah. Yeah, but you'd have to use Magic Lantern. It would be great right. to have that feature on uh, regular cameras. You know, yeah. as just like that's such an easy thing. Right. Although you might end up with another can of worms, like uh, Sony did with uh, what was it? I believe it was the FS seven hundred. Remember with the hack where it was basically uh, the settings file was stored on the card, and they changed one setting from ten eighty p to four k, and the camera started recording four k. Lo and uh -oh. behold, and it was not supposed to. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, there is that problem. Yeah. All right. Moving anyway, on down the line to cameras that may have problems. Let's talk about the Black Magic what? Ursa Mini 4.6K. Now, before we dig deeper into this, I wanted to mention, and Mitch, you might be able to comment on this. Uh, did you notice that uh, they're releasing this without global shutter after yeah. all of the hubbub about? Uh, uh, waiting for this camera to get out there on the market and that it was going to have global shutter. Oh, we're going to be missing out on that feature. Uh, what do you think about that? Uh, it's it's interesting and confusing, and I understand some of the problems. I found it very interesting last night that uh, I was out on Facebook looking for some NAB stuff, and I saw a couple of people comment that... Um, Hey, maybe we shouldn't get so excited this year about uh, Black Magic announcements because it takes them like a year <laughs> to get <laughs> products out. Uh, and, you know, so we've true. we've had to say this about Black Magic, but Tom, come on, Black Magic before. It seems to be a repetitive story, and here's the perfect example of them making an announcement at NAB and the camera not appearing until the following NAB. So. Be cautious with Black Magic. We love what they're doing. They're doing some incredible stuff. And and if you watch the video uh, from the Black Magic or some Mini 4.6K, it's pretty freaking amazing. Uh, it does look there's good. high dynamic range. They're claiming 15 stops. Uh, and and this the feature that we featured on Planet 5D. There's a couple of others that just came out, which I haven't gotten posted yet. Gotten posted haven't posted yet, uh, are pretty nice. The one that uh, Sebastian Weingartner posted is they put together this quick shoot, uh, got some volunteers to do the acting, and uh, that that screen grab right there that you're showing is you know in, inside of a cave looking out, and you can see parts of the walls. And they shot that all with no additional light. Uh, it was mm. all natural light shooting. Uh, so it's pretty phenomenal. Waiting a year to get the global shutter to work, and then and then realizing that the global shutter shutter isn't working, uh, it is very nice that uh, Grant, who is the CEO of Blackmagic, actually released a video, and I have not yet had a chance to watch it because I just saw the link this morning. Uh, but apparently, he discusses in detail about why they weren't able to get that working, and they finally just decided that they needed to put the dadgum thing out. Um, so you can get the Blackmagic Ursa 4K, and that's been out for a while, and they say that's really good for shooting uh, sports and, and other good stuff, and they really were aiming this at, at filmmakers. Uh, but it's, it's a little disappointing to see them work so hard to get something and then still have to pull a feature out uh, so, now as a as a filmmaker myself, I don't find uh, global shutter as extremely attractive as others. Do you, do you think uh, uh, that many of us really need uh, global <laughs> shutter for filmmaking? I mean, is Jello Cam such a horrible thing that people are just screaming for global shutter? You and I have talked about this before. Um, I'll I won't forget. Um... <laughs> and as soon as I start to say it, I forget. Uh, there was a <laughs> there was a TV show about <clears throat> excuse me, I got frogs too. About a two years ago, that was a documentary kind of thing, and they did whip pans all over the place because it was supposed to sort of be like uh, you know people documenting things on the fly and so something would happen and they would do whip cams whip pans and and if you did a pause at the, as they were doing the pan 
you know, the everything in the view would be at like a 45 degree angle because of the rolling shutter effect. Okay, guess what? The public didn't care. They watched the Dagum show because it was interesting. It's all about the content. It has nothing to do with whether or not you have a global shutter and 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 the pixel peepers were just like, oh, I can't believe this 45 degree. I mean, it's horrible rolling shutter. And nobody, nobody who was watching the show and enjoyed the show gave a rat's ass about whether that whip pan had rolling shutter or not. Well, that was a, one of the things, actually. I took the uh, A7S out on a shoot uh, this last week, and I, I showed up, and I'm, I'm, I'm just shooting rotating products for this company. And one of their employees came over and was like, how do you feel about the, the rolling shutter issues on the A7S Mark, Mark II and A7S? And I looked at him like, well, what do you mean? <laughs> and they're like, well, you know, doesn't that ruin these shots? Like, well, how would I get rolling shutter issues in this? <laughs> it's just rotating. He's Slowly. Like, He's like, well, what if you move the camera? I'm like, how fast am I going to move the camera? <laughs> you know, this is not a flying dish that I'm chasing across a room against a wall. This is a freaking, you know, uh, uh, I think it was uh, th at that time it was a French press. It's a French press that's sitting on a rotating table that I'm filming stationary. Like, there is no issue. And, you know, after that, I explained what goes on and how that works. And, he, oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Well, why does everybody want global shutter? I'm like, oh, well, you ah. know, there are some very specific uses. You know, if I'm filming an event and there are photographers, for example, like shooting off strobes all over the place, that is a horrible uh, stuttering effect that you get with like half screens of flash right. and so on. Right. You know, if you're trying to generate lightning in a suspenseful scene and you don't want to do it with cgi you want to do it with flashing lights uh, that could be a, a huge issue uh, if you have sports and you want to like see the guy doing 20 flips in the air and like freeze frame something uh you know that could be an issue too but for a lot of uh, narrative stuff or product shots things like that it doesn't really matter it's not that big of a deal yep. and it's the same thing with zooms uh, you know a, a few people i know uh complain that there aren't more zoom rockers available for cameras and it's like, how often do you Zoom? <laughs> yeah, do you Zoom every that. day? Like, no. it, is this like a 1980s uh, sitcom <laughs> where you're just like zooming into the girl, like telling a joke and then zooming back out to the family? No. Who does that? Uh, of course, you know, uh, that said, if you're working on a game show, uh, if you're doing The Price is Right, obviously you're going to be uh, doing quite a bit of Zooming. <laughs> but how many of us really work in that application? Not that many. Right. Especially if you're telling stories, there aren't a lot of times where the Zoom is the most powerful feature that you were just hoping to use in order to accomplish your shot. Uh, exactly. Uh, that's my my rant. We, uh, get, we get very, very pixel peepish feature prone it just drives me crazy sometimes tell the damn story <laughs> now on the ursa mini back to that uh, have you seen any actual reviews because what's come up on my feed so far is mostly just look at this beautiful thing we shot uh it's been well produced and here it is but i haven't actually seen anybody say this is how I enjoy the camera. I really love this. This is working for me in this manner and so on. That's a great setup. Thank you for that. Uh, I find it interesting that uh, Cinema 5D reported it first with the Sebastian Weingartner video. And it specifically says that Sebastian was asked not to make comments about the camera itself. He could talk about the, the video that they shot and the uh, dynamic range and a few of those kinds of things, but he was specifically asked not to talk about the features. Now, they're finally shipping it. Uh, started shipping, and we got the announcement yesterday. Um, but I typically what happens in quote unquote pre production, and I don't know whether those cameras were just early production or pre production, but you know, if you go to any of the exhibits like NAB where they have, say, the 1DX that isn't shipping yet, I'm sorry, the 1DX Mark II that isn't shipping yet, they won't let you put a, a camera in the slot, and they will tell you that it's just a pre-production model, so things may change. Uh, and they, and they, you know, they specifically limit whether or not you can put out video. So here's a situation where you were able to put out video, 
shoot with the camera, put out video, but then not talk about it? How well <laughs> it works? Tell you? It tells you that we're going to be seeing the typical black magic camera software development issues. Uh, I don't know, missing levels, uh, missing other things that you probably need. Maybe I'm, <laughs> I might be just being a jerk to black magic, but everybody's seen this in the past. Every camera that comes out, it's super exciting. You see what they've got and it, it looks like it'd be the perfect thing. And then you get it home and you realize they haven't finished developing all the features that are in the spec list. Uh -huh. like they're coming eventually, you know, give it another year and uh, revision 2.0 or 3.0 or 4.0 will come out. <laughs> and the things that you were initially promised will definitely be in the camera. But by that time, uh, you know, four or five other companies have jumped on the bandwagon and started releasing things that fit your needs as well and are priced in the same range or lower. And you almost want to just toss your black magic camera and move on to the next thing. <laughs> and I'm concerned that the Ursa Mini uh, may be in that same category. I could be wrong. You know, uh, I'm not trying to uh, be mean to black magic because those guys are pushing the industry forward. They're innovating yep. in ways that no one else is doing. And those yep. are all great things. Yep. It's just that to be that ahead of the curve, sometimes you have to... Uh, release things before they're ready to actually rock and roll. And that's sort of what it always feels like with uh, uh, Black Magic is that you have an awesome concept, awesome hardware, and then you have to wait for that hardware to really get into its own. And, and you just nailed it, <clears throat> God, come on, right on the head in the differences between companies like Black Magic is on the bleeding edge and they're releasing stuff way before it's possibly ready, right? Sony is somewhat in that market. They they are leading the industry, and we have had some complaints about Sony afterwards, after you get the camera. And then there's the Nikons and the Canons who fully test and bank everything in, and if that camera comes out and it has some bugs in it, it's a real shocker, right? And, you know, the only thing that was wrong with the 5D Mark II that I recall, was, okay, two things. One, it didn't have 24 frames per second, right? Was That was the firmware fix that they added later. But it did have the black sun, black light problem when it first came out. Uh, but Canon is not going to come out with features until they fully tested that camera and they know they can put it in the professionals hands which again is why i still think i mean if you go look at the market share black magic gets all sorts of excitement uh but realistically they don't have a big chunk of the market right sony has a bigger chunk of the market than black magic does and canon and nikon have the biggest chunk because guess what the dang things work yeah, and I don't mean to just be saying Canon is the only thing, right? Everybody thinks I'm a just purely Canon guy, uh, and that's all I do own. But that's a whole other story. But <laughs> there's a reason why I think if you think about all these things, and we've talked about several of them here, the the service levels, the the product build quality that you've mentioned with Sony and and Canon, you get what you pay for here, in many regards. Quoting my father from the grave. Well, there are companies that are actually offering up uh, really good value propositions that are fully uh, functional and ready to roll. And I would say Panasonic is pretty good about that. Uh, when they roll out features in their top line cameras like the GH4, they're just about ready to go. And then they roll those features down into lower price models towards the end of life of the higher end models. So then you have the G7, which is pretty much fully baked, not, a, not any real crazy issues and very affordable. So there is a whole range. And then I say that while I'm looking at the E1Z cam that I'm using as a webcam right now. And you know why I'm using it as a webcam, folks? Because no. it's not good as a regular camera. <laughs> uh, it's fine for 1080p. It's supposed to have 4K acquisition. These guys have still not fixed a lot of the issues with this particular camera. Uh, it, it's at version 0.26 in the firmware cycle, which means they haven't even gotten out of beta into regular wow. uh, firmware updates. So, and and this camera is out on the market too. So the black magic is not the only one guilty right. of kicking stuff out exactly. into the world. Yeah. Now, oh, go ahead, Mitch. 
No, I, I'm just going, uh-huh, uh-huh, I'm doing the Ed McMahon thing. Yeah. Uh-huh, now, uh-huh. speaking of kicking stuff out into the world here and seeing what sticks, let's talk about an Indiegogo campaign because, you know, these always make me feel a little wishy-washy when I see them. Uh, this is the Revel Arc. Uh, the claim here is that this camera will give you in-camera image stabilization. Uh, it's capable of recording up to 4K and has all of the fitness tracking features you could want, including the speed of travel, your position in the world, GPS, and all those things. Uh, it's also got AMP Plus capabilities, so if you're wearing a heart monitor or what have you, the information can be shared with the camera. Now, this is an Indiegogo campaign. It looks like the pricing is around $199 to $399, depending on which uh, version you want and when you jump on. And... The reason I bring this up, Mitch, and I'll, I want your informa- or your comments on this in just a second, it feels as though this is a combination of the Garmin Action Cam and something we've seen before. And they're saying this is a steady cam, but what they're really doing here is the same thing as the Steady XP, which we saw, uh, I believe this campaign launched in like 2015 and is finally starting to hit the market. It's basically a set of accelerometers and three-axis uh, measurements in order to loop that in with the video and use that information to create a stabilized warp stabilized basically image in the camera now this first version the steady can or the steady xp that i posted there it's uh it's still not quite ready to roll yet uh people have been talking about this uh the kickstarter backers have been having issues with it uh this one that one actually ejected its information via an audio channel on the camera uh, what do you think about this, uh, uh, Revel arc is you think they're going to do anything better with this versus the previous iterations of this style of image stabilization? It all comes down to whether or not they have done any real early development. Now it looks like they have, I mean, the sample video, if that's really true, you know, not faked in some way, you never know. Right. Uh, but uh, it looks pretty impressive, uh, and I want I want to correct you just a hair. Uh, it's it start huh? Oh yeah, I, I saw that I messed up on the pricing. It starts yeah. at three ninety nine, then one ninety nine. As soon as I read that, it's a mount master bundle. Right. Like right. what? Really, you're selling a mounting master bundle without the right. camera? Good job. Right, right. So so it actually starts at three forty nine, but that's okay. Uh, so. It's it's intriguing, and uh, I I put my six thousand dollars in to get the biggest bundle. Not, I don't know. I don't even know what. It, oh, it's three thousand. Um, Enjoy a private kite surfing lesson <laughs> with professionals. Sweet for three thousand dollars. Yeah. Um, it look. I mean, I was very impressed with the the ability for it to swivel, at, and because they show in the video somebody like with a selfie stick making the camera go around their head and the fact that the camera swivels inside the body so it's always perfectly level that's awesome that looks pretty cool makes it very appealing but like you say the the question marks in terms of all of those advanced features being there when they shift this in december 2016 i'm not cutting on it in any way shape or form they've got they got a lot of creating to do. I was a little skeptical, actually, of uh, the tire attachment. Did you see that, where he puts it in the center of the tire and it rotates? Yeah. Uh, yeah how fast that. would the the sensor have to rotate in order to keep up with that? And what kind of motor drivers would you be using internally to have that spin at that rate? Uh, uh, yeah, good it point. Seems, seems a little uh, questionable. Now, it, it could be calculated, and that is very possible. Uh, if the accelerometers can measure what is level and rotate the video at that speed, that's completely fine. But uh, if you think about the video itself, you're going to have to crop in in order to enjoy that sort of rotation. And the videos I've seen from this, even though they claim 4K, uh, look to be mostly 1080p. And my guess is that's a very strong uh, warp stabilization going on yeah. in the camera with the metadata gathered from the position sensor. Now... Is that a problem? Uh, probably not. You know, 1080p is good for most things, and uh, even now, 4K isn't really super prevalent. But 
their claim to fame in their advertising material is that we are the first uh, steady stabilized, you know, internally stabilized uh, 4K camera. Well, sort of. But if you can't actually use your stabilization system with 4K, then yeah. are you really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't, know. I don't know. Being a jerk here. No, you're not. You're being a very uh, passionate consumer who's been burned in the past. Um, and I that's what seen my lily. <laughs> yeah, that's what people really need to think about because you get so excited, and and I confess I'm in the same boat. You know, you think that something's going to be really cool and it's really fun to be able to help them develop the product. And in many cases, it works. Uh, the peak design folks have have really mastered uh, Kickstarter and Indiegogo campaigns, and they can raise a boatload of money to help them develop products, and they turn out great. But there's always those guys that are working out of their garage, and they think they can do something, and they promote the <laughs> hell out of it, and it turns out not to be the case. So you have to be very cautious, especially if you're not super rich and just have money to throw around. I mean, because you could throw $400 at one of these things and I mean, and, and let's go back and, and people who pre-ordered the Blackmagic um, Ursa Mini 4 6K 10, 11 months ago and still haven't gotten their their dead gum <laughs> thing. So even, even the bigger brands you got to watch out for. Now, I will say that this is um, a product from Y Combinator, and if you're not familiar with that, that is a startup incubator. Yep. Uh, generally, you have to go through uh, some sort of uh, vetting process in order to even get into Y Combinator, and then you have mentors and uh, angel investors that kind of keep an eye on you to see that your product item or idea is making progress in a manner that is acceptable for a future sales. So uh, that does provide a little bit of legitimacy to this. And uh, to be fair, the technology has been uh, uh, implemented in other devices uh, previously. Uh, this is simply taking that and putting it into a single package. Now, I did find it interesting that this is tube-shaped, uh, and we have been seeing a lot more tube-shaped action cameras lately. Uh, I mentioned the Garmin before, but uh, Sony developed that same shape. Do you think that has something to do with the off-the-shelf uh, sensor system that they're using in these devices? Uh, there's mention of possible partnership with Sony, so uh, maybe a Sony sensor of some kind, or maybe a re-implementation of Sony's action cam? Uh, in this case, I suspect it has a lot more to do with the fact that they want to rotate the lens, or, you know, the whether it's the whole sense, I would imagine that's the whole sensor too, right? Duh. Maybe. Um, I think that's the issue in this case, but uh, I don't. I don't know. I would like to see uh, some more on this and see how it actually works. Uh, yeah. A lot of times yeah. with these promo videos, you know, and I've done this before too for people that have hired me. Uh, the video we produce is the best video we could possibly produce for their item. Uh, in real world, uh, you often find that there are actually limitations to these products. What? But those don't make it into <laughs> the demo video because the demo video is meant to showcase, right. not to locase this item. Oh, what a what a what a phrase! You'd, if if it's exciting, then save a few bucks and wait till they produce the dead gum thing and see if it really works. All right, a few last things to cover here before we get out of here. I wanted to mention uh, the newest version of Lightroom is out. Uh, if you're planning on picking up a Sony A6300 or a Canon uh, 1DX Mark II, because you have way more money than I do, <laughs> uh, you can uh, uh, catch up on this new version of Lightroom. Uh, this also is uh, incorporated with the Adobe DNG release 9.5. So if you do convert your photos to DNG, uh, they've updated that with more lens supports, uh, more camera supports, as well as a bunch of manual focus lenses. Um, I've been a Lightroom user for years, so this is great for me. Uh, Mitch, we've talked about this before. You're not really... <laughs> I, I don't know if you're probably excited about this, are you? And Well, eventually I will be because I will have to dump my... 
uh, Apple aperture because it will fall off the face of the earth, but I'm not moving until I have to. Um, aperture works great for me for what I do, and I don't really want to bite the bullet to move yet. So, How do you no, feel that... about the subscription-based Adobe oh. Cloud system? Does that irritate the snot out of you? Yes, but I understand why they're doing it, and... Uh, it makes a lot of sense for a lot of people, and it doesn't make sense for some people. And it just depends. We talked about before, you you can't please everybody. Uh, and I mean, you, they could by offering some different options, but then it makes it more complicated for the salespeople and for support and everything else. So it's great that you get updates frequently, Lots of good things that they support. Um, overall, broken updates. I actually yeah. uh, premiere for about a month straight. I had to downgrade because it yeah. was uh, it was screwing things up uh, immensely until they released a patch for it. Uh, I will say though, for me personally, it it does equal about the same, maybe a little bit less in in cost. Uh, I was originally spending, I think it's fifty. It was fifteen hundred dollars, maybe. Uh, Eighteen hundred dollars for the entire master suite package. Uh, now I pay. I want to say it's like three hundred dollars a year, three twenty-five a year for my subscription. So you know, it take me a, a good number of years to get up to the fifteen hundred dollars I was uh, spending previously, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, works out. And then I always am on top of things as opposed to you know, for a while when new versions of Premiere were coming out, I was limping along on 5.5 .5 and then limping uh -huh. along on six because I was too cheap to uh -huh. upgrade. Uh -huh. uh, now this just makes it a simple one click for upgrades. So in that regard, I am somewhat happy with the uh, system. Uh, for those of you that are on a cheaper budget, uh, $9 a month, I think is the photo package, which includes Lightroom, uh, Photoshop, and possibly one other item that I cannot think of off the top of my head. So check that out so, if you're interested. So do you have the ability, because I never use this, do you have the ability to not accept the upgrades? And yes. and is that something that should be smart for most people to just wait until everybody else works out the bugs? I, I generally run the updates on one system first, play around with it, and then once I feel like it's stable, I will put it on all my systems. But what's really nice is with uh, Adobe's update system, you can go to previous models or versions all the way back to, uh, I believe, 5.0. So in the case of somebody sent me a project that they'd worked on in a really old version of Premiere, and I couldn't get it to open in CC, I was able to actually install uh, Premiere 6.0 via the Adobe installer app and then open up the program or open up their files without any issue and then import those into uh, newer versions of Premiere and, and get it back up to where I'm normally working. And well, they do cool. provide that kind of access. Uh, you do have to root around in the menus to, to figure it out. The other thing with the master suite, it gives you access to things that you don't normally even use. Uh, right. In general, there's a number of Adobe products that are out there that aren't really something that I'm super excited about or I, I want to jump on the bandwagon with. But occasionally, somebody sends me an Illustrator file, and I can install Illustrator on whichever uh, computer I'm using and work with the file and kick it out, do whatever I want with it. And that's not something I do all the time, but it's nice to have access to that when I need to work with it. Same with the PDF generator. I mean, I don't generate too many PDFs, but it's really nice to have... XPDF uh, when you need it, and so on. Yeah. So those are all How long things. does all that... I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. How long does something like that take for you to to back down to a, ge a generation or install something differently? Uh, the downloads are uh, roughly 2 gig or so, maybe 3 gig, depending on the program you're installing. So on my current internet connection, it takes about 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes to download and install. And it doesn't back out of the uh, the newest version. It just installs multiple copies. So you'll have oh. uh, CC uh, 1.5 or CC you know 5, whatever your version you're on, and you could have 6.0 uh, Premiere Pro installed at the same time. And you just need to, when you open the file, select Open with Premiere Pro 6.0 instead of Open with CC. 
and that sort of uh, ability makes it really nice to go back in versions. Uh, yeah, that to dump everything that you're working on on your latest version. Well, that makes it better. Yeah, see, I'm it's, glad I asked that question. It's a uh, you know, at first I was really irritated about the subscription model, uh, but really a lot of times you want the programs to continue to advance and get better. Right. And the only way they can do that is if they're making a steady stream of income. And well, they hope to make that income via uh, one-time sales. One-time sales are less, uh, less of a constant revenue than the subscription-based model. And sometimes it's worth it to pay for that. Uh, right now, the video switcher I'm using, which you guys may have noticed this beautiful mm -hmm. crossfade right here, uh, it is, I believe it's $59 a year uh, for X Splitter service. So it's, you know, you're paying for it, but at the same time, you know, they issue out updates on this on a regular basis. The software works really well. And what's $59 a year work out to? Not that much, you know, we're, we're talking a couple bucks a month. So, I mean, <laughs> if you have a Netflix Starbucks. subscription or some of these other things, you're probably spending that anyway. Give up yep. uh, a couple of gourmet beers every month and you could afford to have <laughs> Premier Pro or one of these other things in your collection. Uh, now, I also wanted to mention while we're talking about the cost of items, did you notice, Mitch, the price drop on the Sony A7S Mark II? Uh, it is now down to $2,399 uh, from eBay seller, I believe it's ProTech something or other. Uh, you know, it's one of these eBay sales. But do you think this might indicate a next version of the A7 line coming at NAB this year? Um, sure, sure, of course. That's what it means. And I don't know. Did you notice yesterday that uh, Canon is is reduced the price of the C500 by oh, six thousand yeah. bucks? So it's down to nine thousand from fifteen thousand. So yeah, that's price drops all drop. around. <laughs> Save some I, money. Well, that's a, a couple of people have, have hit me up via email, and uh, this is basically me answering your question now since I didn't reply to those emails. Uh, <laughs> they were asking about the A7S Mark II uh, that I just switched over to, and and wondering if uh, that is the way to go. And the the argument's always been have the camera do the work and don't worry about the next camera that's coming. But we're within a month of NAB now and crap is going to get announced at NAB stuff is going to not just crap, good stuff. too. <laughs> uh, there's going to be a lot of announcements at NAB. Uh, we'll probably see some surprise amount announcements, maybe from Panasonic or maybe from Sony, maybe even from Canon, who knows? And when those announcements hit, it's going to drive down current items prices substantially. So if you don't have anything, in the oven ready to bake in the next month maybe holding off till those announcements at nab might give you the option to save another three or four hundred dollars when the prices start falling on some of the current line models as people sell them off and flood the market in order to save up for that next round of cameras um, if you do have something going buy the camera but if you don't yeah. there you go uh, mitch what do you think about that is that a, a fair way to go Yes, and I have people have written me several times in the last couple of weeks asking the very same kinds of questions, and I constantly say, uh, NAB is coming up in a month. <laughs> Why are you even considering buying something? If you have to buy something now, buy it now. But if you don't have to have it, wait, and let's see what happens. And like you say, the other side of that is the prices are going to drop on current models, and and especially if you can get models out on eBay like this and save three, four hundred bucks, that's amazing. Well, and I'm actually I realized now that I'm a little lucky that I managed to sell my five D Mark III off for two thousand. Uh now brand new models are selling for under eighteen hundred dollars on eBay. Wow. So the price is starting to fall off I missed fairly it. substantially. Yeah. Well you yeah. talked about that last week, I think it was last week about if you Wanted to time the market. Now's the time to do it. Yep, and it's starting to it's starting to dive. People are doing the same thing that I am, speculating on the camera market. Via you started it. Items. You you announced it on this show, and you crashed the market. Thanks, DJ. <laughs> Actually, one side note. This has less less to do with the market and more to do with Amazon. But uh, there's a, a review I did a long long time ago, like seven or eight years ago, 
of this really cheap monitor called the hair monitor. And this hair monitor, or high R, however you pronounce it, uh, was like a mediocre uh, standard definition monitor, but it was selling for like $35. What? Yeah, it, it, it was, so it was really cheap. Uh, it had its own battery, and it was basically one of those portable TVs that you get from Radio Shack, but it yeah. had inputs so you could you could plug stuff into it. So I did a review on that. And I was like, this is a great deal at this price. You know, $35, like if you chuck it in the drain, who cares? You know, just go get another one. And the the popularity of the video and the review uh, led to an Amazon uh, brutality where these guys were like marking it up to over $150 uh, from its original price. And people are complaining. They're like, well, this is really expensive now. Do you think I should get it? No, absolutely not. <laughs> the only reason you should have ever bought this is because it was $35. At $100, there are so many other options out there. This is ridiculous. Don't buy this. And it still goes on to this day. Like uh, that video, for whatever reason, has so much traction that these Amazon <laughs> sellers are still selling that freaking crappy monitor from you know, seven years ago for a hundred and some dollars. And it's just ridiculous. So the hair seven inch monitor, if you <laughs> see that video, don't buy it unless it's 20 bucks or 15 bucks or whatever. You can go buy a car backing camera monitor on eBay for like $20 that will give you the same exact resolution. And uh, it doesn't have a cable tuner in it, but who cares? You don't, you don't need that. Unless you're <laughs> trying to get terrestrial television in your, I don't know, your tent somewhere. <laughs> Good job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're funny. All right. Uh, one last thing before we get out of here. What? Um, unless you, well, did no, you have anything else you wanted to touch no. on, Mitch? No, I, we touched on all my buzz, buzz things. Okay. I've, I've got uh, a couple of questions here in the show notes. I'm not going to get to them all today because... We're just about out of time, but I did want to address one, and this comes from Tech Leathercraft. Uh, he'd like to, us to elaborate a little bit more on the pros and cons of fly-by-wire focus and a traditional lens focus. Now, Mitch, I know you know about this. I know about this. You want to take this one? No. You take it. I'll, okay, I'll take it. All right, it's fine. Uh, so if you don't know about lenses, fly-by-wire is a fancy term for basically electronic focus. Uh, as opposed to having gears and physical contact with the lens elements, uh, it is an encoder, a rotary encoder, that encodes the motion of the rotating element and then tells a motor inside the camera lens to move the focus range to, to whatever point it thinks you move to. Now, the downside of that is if you're trying to pull focus, uh, generally these use either a stepper or an ultrasonic drive system, and those drive systems can be jumpy at the best of times and can be really weird at the worst of times. Uh, because of that, if you are a filmmaker and you are trying to pull focus on someone, uh, you can end up with some horrible transitions in focus points from a subject in the foreground to a subject in the background. And that is not very good if that's what you're trying to achieve. Now, with a traditional focus system, the focus ring is actually physically attached via gears and other mechanical objects to the focusing elements of the lens itself. So when you crank that over, you are literally changing the positioning of the focus elements inside the lens in order to change the focus and the depth of the focus on the lens itself. Uh, that does give you smooth transitioning, provided that you have either a smooth enough hand to pull that focus or a follow focus system, which is a gear reducer with a knob that goes around your lens in order to accomplish that focus pulling back and forth from a foreground object to a, a post or a, a background object. Uh, that is the general better use for that in filmmaking. You don't want fly-by-wire for that reason if you are trying to pull focus. Now, as a photographer, if you have fly-by-wire lens, it's not that big a deal because you're going to probably rely on AF a little bit. You're taking stills, so you're not transitioning. So even if you are using your focus ring, it's not that big of an issue because you're just taking a single still. You're not changing uh, your focus depth in shot. Uh, it's not a problem. But for filmmakers, having the ability to either have full manual focus or in the case of many Canon lenses, you have full-time autofocus, which means you can focus manually and you can focus 
via autofocus without damaging or causing any trouble inside the lens. Now, there are issues with certain lenses. Uh, for example, the Tokina brand lenses, uh, where you have to click to engage or disengage the gear system that drives the focus elements. And that doesn't necessarily disengage the focus system itself. So if you're holding onto that, you could literally strip out gears. And Tokina is actually the wrong one to pick on. I should say the early Tamron lenses. Uh, Tokina does disengage their own AF when you click that uh that mechanism. But the Tokina lenses, if you grabbed onto the focus ring while it was trying to focus, you could literally strip out the motor gears on the lens itself. So that is something to be aware of if you're buying cheaper lenses. Uh, hopefully that answers your question. Mitch, do you have anything to add to that? I, I, no, I, I'm, I'm very glad that I handed it off to you because you explained it so much better than, <laughs> than I would have. Uh, so, so the, I think the other pros and cons are that, you know, the fly by wire method is basically theoretically cheaper possibly, uh, and you have less stuff to add. So the cons of, uh, having to add gearing and stuff and have a manual follow focus, it's a con. It costs you extra. Uh, the pluses and minuses though, I think are what you pointed out, the smoothness and the transitions, uh, fly-by-wire can be a real pain in the butt guess when it comes to that. So and there are a lot of really affordable manual focus lenses out there. Just be aware that if you're doing manual focus all the time, you're putting yourself into, uh, you're, you're, you're adding extra work to your table. Um, a lot of people complain that I'm lazy filmmaker and, and that's probably true. I use Canon glass because I can half press, get auto focus and then start recording. And if I need to change my focus, I can twist it with my hand and I'm fine. Uh, but traditionalists and, uh, more, I don't know, uh, traditionalists is probably the best term. Uh, people say that I should always use a follow focus to pull focus and I should have a focus puller working on my focus points. And I've even worked with people that simply walk up to my camera and switch it to manual focus and screw up shots for me because they don't know how I use my gear and they right. feel that I'm using it incorrectly. <gasps> is that the case? Yeah. I don't know. If it works, then it if is it incorrect. That's but right. uh, I'm not going to get into that argument, and I won't tell you that I've chased people off set for doing that to me before, <laughs> but uh, I will say that uh, uh, I have gotten complaints in the past for my methodology. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody would ever, I mean, everybody has their own individual way of doing things. So why would Absolutely. anybody complain about your style if yeah, they yeah. are, they're a jerk. And thankfully many times, uh, I'm the one taking care of all of my camera stuff and not working or butting heads with someone else. Uh, yeah. but in those times where you are assigned a partner or multiple partners, uh, there can be some conflicts of, uh, of style that, uh, uh, come into play pretty <laughs> fast uh, when you start doing that. So uh, I think I'm being as nice as possible, and I'm not calling any uh, individuals no, no. out. No, no, at all. no, no. I, I don't want to. All, all those people that I've worked with in the past, they're great people. Uh, even the people I've run off, uh, <laughs> uh, they're still doing their own stuff. They're great people as well. Uh, you know, so not insulting you guys if you are listening to this. You, you guys are great. I love you. I, just I can't wait to it. talk about these people behind their backs on uh, after the show's over. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. On that I'm note, joking. Mitch, I think uh, this is the end of the show. Do you have anything else to add before we get out of here? Uh, I think people ought to tune in next week for another exciting episode because I forgot to tell you about. You remember last week we were talking about that Venus lens? Yeah. I got an email from them, and we need to talk about that on air next week. So, do you figure out what that soft focus or I, soft? Uh, I, focus yeah, yes, it's all here in this email. We'll talk about it next week on the next episode of the DSLR Film New <laughs> Podcast, brought to you by DJ. All right, guys, you can find me over at DSLRFilmNoob.com. You can find this podcast on SoundCloud, iTunes, and anywhere podcasts are distributed. Mitch, where can people find you? Uh, Planet5D.com. And of course, guys, don't forget to rate, like, and subscribe. Also, if you can, leave your questions in the YouTube comment section because that's a great place for me to find them, and I will try to throw them in the show whenever I get a chance. It's great having you there, and we love hearing from you. So we'll keep you posted. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And i got to find this button while I'm still rambling on to end the show. That was episode 91 of DSLR Film Noob Podcast. 91? 
91. We ought to have a big celebration at 100. 100th episode. Blah, blah, blah. That's almost NAB episode. <laughs> you know, if we really hurried. <laughs> All right, that's the end for the audio listeners. So let me ask you, I don't think I've ever asked, do people hear uh, those comments on the audio version? Uh, they miss out on uh, the end, this end stuff and the stuff we well, talk about during the end of the show, like the music. Yeah, I know. So, so while we're talking over the music, I mean, is what I'm asking, can they hear us? No, I cut that uh, out usually. Oh, you cut it out, okay. Um, sometimes I leave it in if it's interesting banter, uh, but... Uh, <laughs> If uh, you and I are just uh, like laughing at some joke we just told at the end of the show, <laughs> then uh, uh, yeah, because honestly, for the audio listeners, uh, they don't stick around for this sort of Mitch and I talking after the show. And even the YouTube viewers, uh, you guys, some of you do stick around all the way through to the end. Uh, but many times, like after we've covered all of the stuff that we wanted to talk about, they're kind of good to go. So that uh, that raises a very interesting question. Are you the kind of guy that sticks through all of the credits when you go watch a movie at the theater? Or are you one of the people that get up immediately after and leave? I usually stick around unless it's really boring. <laughs> the, the whole movie? No, no. Well, uh. Okay, so like, uh, for example, I just watched Deadpool a couple weeks ago. And uh, at the very end, they had this sort of like cartoon thing going on that was sort of funny right. and then that led into the credits right. and that was enough to like keep me in my seat and watch it all the way through uh you know sometimes you get to the end and it's just like black screen and then you know real credits right and if it doesn't have good music or some sort of like animated thing or interesting bit going on uh, i can watch the stinger on on youtube <laughs> you know it's like i don't really i don't need to stick around for that Especially if they're really long-winded, uh, sometimes the end credit roll will be like three or four minutes. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. I want everybody to be credited in the film. Uh, it's just that uh, that's a lot of time to just sit there and stare at a, a rolling screen and listen to soft jazz while we wait for whatever interesting thing they're going to pop on us at the end. And sometimes you don't even get a oh, star at the end. Most times you don't, yeah. Um, so... Uh, when I do stick around, I'll usually read reviews and find out ahead of time, you know, is there a good stinger on this? And then you know to stick around. Huh. You know what I mean? Maybe that spoils well, it. I don't know. Could be. Yeah, I, I typically will just sit and watch them because I want to read everybody's name and, and totally, and no, you can't do that. But I do. We and Sometimes my kids and I will make a little jokes about uh, people's names, and that's mean too, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> you know, but, as a indie filmmaker, if you read some of the credit lists, uh, we get wacky towards the end because, you know, you have you have all these people and some of them, they showed up on set, but you're like, wait a minute, what did George do? Yeah. Uh, George, he was supposed to do this, but really he just kind of like he hung ate around. the craft service table food and like <laughs> hung out the whole time and didn't do anything. So let's credit him with dink off. Yeah. Dink off. Yeah. Okay. Got it. You know, like, <laughs> and then, uh, you know, when you're screening it for the first time in front of a group, the group uh, generally will stick around to see their names on the credit list. And when they get that little insult or poke in the face for not doing their job correctly, it's kind of a fun to see the reactions. Uh, don't be like me, though, folks. No, don't do not do that. That's that's not nice. Oh, very funny. All right. On that note, guys, uh, that's the end of the extra content for Mitch and I, unless you have anything else to rant about, sir. No, 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 no. I'll send you this email from the venus optics guys and we'll put that in the show for next week definitely interested in reading that and we'll get to more of your questions guys next week thanks for submitting those we'll see you bye